evening. This is a meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education. It is Thursday, <coughs> September 15th, 2016. May I have the attendance, please, Mrs. Sizemore? Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massingill? Here. Dr. Miles? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Mrs. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Is on her way. <coughs> Ms. Hobbs? Here. Very good. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we, but before we move to 4.0, uh, Mrs. Sizemore has an announcement to make. I just wanted to make the board aware and the public that on October 1st, um, there will be a job fair that uh, we've been working with Gorm, South Portland, and Westbrook. And it is a job fair that's being done at um, Huston University on Spring Street. And it is for all positions in uh, a school department. It is to make people aware, do some of the trainings ahead of time on confidentiality, help people get their fingerprinting, um, application done uh, to help them move forward if they'd like to be a substitute and we have several flyers around town in regards to it but that's October 1st at Huston University from 9 to 11. And, and that's only for, for substitute teachers? Teachers, bus drivers, custodians, food service, ed techs, excellent, all positions. So, thank you. 4.0, are there any adjustments to the agenda? There are none. 5.0, is there anyone from the public who wishes to make a statement? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing. 6.0, new business, 6.1. <coughs> Meeting minutes of July 28, 2016, is there a motion? Moved. Approval as printed. Second. Are there any changes, additions? Seen. All in favor? Six. Okay. Six. And one absent. And 6.2, meeting minutes of August 18, 2016. Move approval is printed. Second. Any changes, corrections? <coughs> All in favor? I wasn't here. So okay, I'm so we have one, one, two, three, four, plus one, and, and I don't three, three of six. You weren't here. Okay. So three, three absences, I guess. 6.3 meeting <coughs> minutes of September 1st, 2016. Move approval is printed. Second. Very good. Any changes? All in favor? <coughs> one, two, three, four, five, plus one, and one absent, and two absent then. Is that the right? One, no. two, three, six. Six. Six, plus six, six plus one. Okay. <coughs> six plus one. Thank you. And 6.4. A donation to high school athletics. So we had an anonymous donation of three thousand five hundred dollars for the boys and girls basketball to be used for team apparel for the varsity players. And so thank you to our anonymous donor. All right. Very good. Um, <coughs> will you send them a thank you on behalf of the board? Whoever it is. <laughs> I mean, uh, Mr. Creech? I don't know that we know who it is. It's anonymous. This is probably going to be your chance to thank them. Yeah. So okay. So is there a motion to accept the donation? So moved. With thanks. Second. All in favor? Four, five, six plus one. Thank you so much. Thank you so we much. We appreciate anonymous donations. <coughs> yes, absolutely. Very generous. We appreciate it greatly. And 7.0 will now work, move into our workshop portion of the session this evening. 
7.1 will be our summer programs review. Superintendent? So this summer we had um, multiple programs going on and uh, we asked some of the program leaders to come tonight to represent and share some of the work that's been going on. Um, you may have been reading in recent articles that the value of summer learning and how important it is for students that have severe disabilities to minimize regression. Um, it also allows for some students to get a jump start that may have not had prerequisite experience such as preschool. Um, and then for other students who have achievement gaps to close in terms of um, whether it be reading or writing, um, it's a great opportunity for us to really connect with our students and families uh, in a way that looks a little bit different than what we do in the school year, but it also allows us to test out some ideas um, that can be carried over into the school year as well. So this evening we will hear from our um, <coughs> special services department about the extended school year. Um, the curriculum department will uh, present on the summer reading academy and then from K our K-2 to um, phase level we have a principal here tonight to present on Jump Start. So um, is there anyone who's ready to go first? Sure. Right. Let's go ahead, Chris, and just introduce yourself, and then you may begin. So, I've been. so I'm Chris Rohde, the Assistant Director of Special Services here in Scarborough, and uh, one of my roles is to help uh, organize, hire staff, do a good schedule for our extended school year uh, program. So we thought it made sense for me to speak to this uh, tonight. And um, we have some slides to go along with the presentation, I think, hopefully. Oh, Bodie. We have a podium. All right. <laughs> 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 Hopefully, am I moving the slide along here? Because that could be a challenge. You see the remote? Black one? Black. Little tiny black one. This one right here? Yes. All right. There we go. Okay. So um, the first thing that I wanted to do tonight was just to give a little background are eligible for extended school year services and how we make those determinations. So uh, first thing to know, of course, is that um, only students that receive special education services are eligible for extended school year services. And eligibility for ESY services are determined by the IEP team. Um, so our regulations give us some guidance around some of the factors we look at in making those eligibility determinations. And I've listed the, uh, the three main things that we look at up there on the slide. So uh, the first thing is really with any IEP meeting, we want to make sure we have all the information available for the student on the table in front of the team. Uh, so that all members of the team, be it uh, parents, teachers, uh, administrators, sometimes students, uh, have that information in front of them to help make uh, the decisions. So uh, we look at progress reports, any assessments we have, reports from parents, observations, documentation. Um, the second thing that we consider is the significance of the student's disability and progress towards IEP goals. And then the third thing that we can uh, think about is the impact of any previous service interruptions, if there have been any. So if we've had a student that's been with us, um, has gone away for the summer and come back in the fall, we want to take a look at how they've done when they come back to school. And um, kind of the key point here, the probability that the student will be unable to recoup previously mastered skills in a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. So those are the criteria that we look at. Um, and either Allison or myself uh, try to go to most of those ESY uh, eligibility meetings just so we're maintaining some consistency in how we're applying uh, that criteria. So what happens when the <coughs> team determines that a student is eligible? The next step is to decide which services a student will receive. And these services can include direct instruction in reading or math, social skills, uh, writing. Um, we also sometimes uh, put in consultation services for our summer programs. And students are also eligible to access related services, occupational therapy, speech, physical therapy, behavioral services as well. So important to note here that this is an individual decision based on student needs. So we don't have a you know, quote unquote program for a certain type of disability or need. Um, the IEP team for each individual student makes that decision. Uh, another part of that process is deciding how much time the student will receive. 
So, for example, the student needs assistance with um, reading over the summer. The team will determine how much time that student will receive. Uh, transportation is a big part of ESY, so students are eligible for transportation in support of the program. And um, that's uh, a big thank you to our transportation department. They do a great job every year of pulling that together. Uh, we have a lot of kids coming and going at different times to different buildings. Uh, that's a real challenge, and um, they do a great job of that. Uh, and finally, prior to the beginning of the summer, uh, parents receive a letter from me with information about the student's schedule and also provide names of the uh, staff that will be working with their child. So I thought just some basic statistics about what we did this summer. So we had 87 students qualify for services this year, and uh, 70 of those students did uh, participate. Um, that's one of the challenges, I guess, around planning for ESY is we don't know how many of those students are going to be with us. And so unless we hear in advance, which we don't always do, we have to plan for you know, whatever number are, are eligible. Uh, we had 55 staff working with us this year. We had nine special education teachers, 25 ed techs, uh, three occupational therapists, two speech pathologists, a physical therapist, two behavioral specialists, a nurse, eight bus drivers and four bus aides. And we held our programs at Wentworth Middle School, High School, and used approximately 20 classrooms. And again, facilities uh, did a great job of getting those rooms ready for us. For some of our students with more significant uh, developmental needs, we use a lot of equipment that needs to be moved from building to building. And um, that's a big part of the beginning and the end of the summer as well. And for our schedule this year, we ran from July 5th to August 11th. So we usually we look at the six-week program for students that's worked well for us in the past. And uh, we run Mondays through Thursdays. Um, I looked at all the programs here. I'll just go through them kind of quickly. But basically, we have uh, ELA and math programs. And we break that up by age level, just in terms of organizing students so they can uh, work in groups with other kids. So we have a, a K2 group, a 3-5 group, a 6 eight group and then we had I think just one student from the high school this year so I kind of lumped them in with the, the middle school group for that. And then we have a number of life skills programs that we run during the summer and these programs really uh, are pretty much a replication of what we do during the school year. So we had functional life skills <coughs> program, classroom for K-2 with six kids. We had an academic life skills program with eight students, grades three through five. Uh, kind of a combined academic functional life skills program at the middle school for six students, um, functional life skills program at high school with seven students, and then an academic life skills program at the high school with six students. And then we have four students that just received related services, a couple of kids who came in for speech services, and a couple of others who came in for combination of speech and OT. So just a couple of other highlights here for ELA and math. Um, we're fortunate and we've been fortunate for the last few years that some of our in-house staff are uh, willing to work during the summer. Uh, so a great connection. They know a lot of the kids. And most importantly, they're familiar with the programs that we're running. So we have a lot of continuity and consistency with what we do during the school year. So we had four of our current resource room uh, special education teachers work this summer, along with four ed techs that are also in our system during the school year. So typically for ELA and math instruction, we run groups that will go either one or two hours per subject, and most students are getting that two days per week. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, I think the focus is on using the same instructional programs that students receive during the school year. So we're trying to avoid regression skills in the fall, so the more consistent we can be during the summer with our instruction, the better outcome we have. And um, also important to note that uh, in our ELA and math programs, this is really another opportunity for us to work on student social skills and emotional regulation skills as well. It's really our best opportunity to try to recreate what a classroom looks like during the summer. So we do use it for that purpose as well. So our life skills programs, as I said a minute ago, uh, really all aspects of these programs are based on the services that students receive during the school year. So we're really trying to replicate that same program so when kids come back in the fall, it's familiar and they're ready to go. Uh, important you guys to know as well, I think, that we do a lot of work in the community. So our students in our 6 through 12 functional life skills programs did um, pretty wide variety of supported job opportunities in the community. And we're very fortunate here in Scarborough that 
Uh, we've had some great connections with local businesses uh, through a lot of the hard work of some of our teachers here and just businesses being open to working with our kids, so that's been awesome. So this year, uh, Roots Recyclables, Walmart, Sparkle Car Wash, Rolling Recyclables uh, with supported job placements for functionalized skills. We also have a slowly awesome reverse mainstream program at the high school where uh, mainstream kids are coming into the functional life skills program and working with kids. That's been going on for a number of years now. And um, a lot of those kids come in and keep that work going during the summer. So this year we have six of those students participating. And then for our academic life skills uh, at the high school, uh, we have a whole other set of supported job opportunities. And you can see from the slide again a, a pretty wide variety of opportunities. Dairy Corners, Planning Hill Farm, Egg and I, Mr. Dale, Scarborough Terrace, Land Bank, and Camp Kitchen. Uh, so for related services, speech and OT, PT, and behavioral services, um, we had a little bit of a challenge this year around staffing for speech services. So um, for the first time in a while, um, <coughs> actually I think the first time ever, we had to contract out for speech services. Um, we were fortunate to uh, work with someone who did a little bit of work with us during the school year this year, so there was a little bit of familiarity there. Um, but that, um, we did a consult piece before the start of the summer so those providers could get to know our kids and our current services. So we have 30 students receive speech services this summer, 29 receive OT, 15 students receive physical therapy services, and we also had our two behavioral specialists in this summer, uh, both doing a little bit of direct instruction with some kids, uh, kind of a bigger uh, program consult piece, again, to address some of the social, behavioral, and emotional needs. Uh, so finally, my last slide, um, how do we know how well we did? Um, all of our IEP goals uh, that are addressed during ESY are graded at the end of the summer and we're pretty data focused in how to grade our IEPs. Uh, copies of these scored goals, uh, I get those out to case managers at the very start of the school year. So um, case managers come back, related service providers come back, they haven't worked with a student over the summer. Um, they have that information right at their fingertips to get going at the start of the year. And uh, parents also <coughs> receive copies of uh, the graded IP goals at the end of the summer. So that's ESY in a nutshell. Thank you. Any questions? So of the students that did not access the program during the summer, I think there were what, like 10 or so? I can't uh, recall. Close what was the first class? 17, 17, 17 okay. I think, yeah. So yeah. of those, that group of students that didn't access I mean, when they come back in the fall, do you check to see, gee, how much did they lose over the course of that? And, you know, I mean, because obviously it's data driven and, you know, just a curiosity <coughs> to see, you know, do they lose? And then how can you encourage, I'm assuming it's the family that you would need to encourage to, you know, say, yeah. gee, here's our program. and. You know, you, your student didn't access this year or this past summer. You know, how can we help you get past whatever issue it might be? Yeah, that's a great question. So a couple of quick responses. And the first would be that I actually reach out to any anybody I, that I know that I didn't know wasn't coming. So we have some people, some kids that we get to the first week, we get to the second week, we haven't seen them. <coughs> so I'll do an outreach um, with those families just to see if there's something getting in the way of students attending. Um, certainly. You know, during the next school year, when the IEP team has a conversation about the need for ESY services, <coughs> that team would go back and look at that very question. Hey, how did this student do when they come back? Came back in the fall, and if they did have some trouble getting back up to speed, if we did see a regression of skills, that's certainly a conversation we would have, you know, with the family. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there's a variety of reasons for that. I think some families. Um, have other things that they're doing and there's a conflict that they can't work out. There's actually a couple of students every year who would be eligible for our services but might choose to do summer reading academy instead. That's usually a pretty small number but there would be a couple in that camp as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, great question. I think at the end of the day it's really about connections with the families, kind of outreach, explaining to them the importance of the program and just trying to understand um, any barriers that they're putting in the way of that. So, okay. Jackie? Yes. To your knowledge, any of the <coughs> children, uh, students who did not attend our program, uh, attend other programs? For example, did they go to a camp or uh, did they go to a 
dance school or something of that nature, something of interest? Yeah. Um, I think, Jackie, just off the top of my head, I would say we, we have a couple of families probably every summer who um, go to camp for the summer and things like that, so they're just not physically close enough to access uh, services. But most kids that are accessing camp opportunities during the summer, they might miss a week or two of ESY. And we'll say, hey, that's fine. We'd rather have you here for four weeks than, than no week, you know, the no time at all. And um, our staff during the summer are really good about, you know, sending some work off with kids while they're out. So, um, so I don't think it's so much a matter of a conflict with, with summer white camp pieces. It's sometimes it's just a matter of people going, you know, up the coast for the summer or something like that. I had a, a question. Um, Chris. So are all those services that we, we, we provide required by federal or state mandates? For example, the OT and the speech and language seem like things that people wouldn't re regress that much on. You know, probably got that wrong, but is that all required? Yeah, absolutely. So, and that's, you know, no, that's a part of that IEP team process. and. When I'm chairing a meeting around ESY, um, you know, we have a, a pretty clear conversation about is what a student needs, not what might be nice for students. So we know that probably every student that receives special education services would benefit from coming in over the summer on some level to get some extra help. We're really focused only on those students that we know from past experience or the nature of their disability that if they don't come in and receive these services, there's going to be a, a significant regression of skills. And we're talking about uh, kids coming back and maybe engaging in really, you know, disruptive behaviors or kids coming back and it taking four or five or six weeks to get back to the reading level they were at in June. So, um, yeah, a lot of the students that receive OT, PT, and speech, not all of them certainly, but a lot of them are students in our life skills programs. And um, those services are really integral to kind of the day-to-day -day running of their program. Anything else? Very good. Thank you, Chris. That's a good update. Well, who's next? So Monique um, Culbertson is our Director of Curriculum Instruction, and she's going to present on the Summer Reading Program. Academy has been in Scarborough now over 10 years, believe it or not. When we took a look back a bit, um, it was pretty amazing to think that we're in the double digits at this point, which is a truly a wonderful thing. Uh, Summer Reading Academy is locally funded. It is not a requirement like the Summer ESY program. It is something that we offer in order to provide a bridge between academic years. It has two focuses. One is primarily for students, and it's for struggling readers. And so it is for those students who are receiving academic support for reading or special needs students. <clears throat> it's also, though, um, has a purpose to improve staff's instructional skills in teaching struggling readers. And so the first hour of the academy is a seminar, and typically, it's led by the two co uh, coordinators, but they usually have a central text that they work from. And this summer, we've worked with um, a text called Reading Strategies. And as uh, Julie mentioned earlier, um, we sort of pilot that text. And what we've discovered as a result of the Summer Reading Academy is it would make a wonderful supplemental text for all teachers K-5 in, read in assisting and supplementing the, the reading curriculum as moving forward. <coughs> So the students come in for a two-hour period uh, during the day from 9 to 11, and then from 11 to 12, the teachers have a seminar and a follow-up um, as well. And so the first student hour is really the students are in small groups, about two or three students per staff person, and they are receiving direct instruction in those areas in which they need assistance in terms of reading skills. So it's targeted. Usually those small groups are students who have the same needs. The second hour is focused on uh, <clears throat> a research project. 
and it's focused around a topic of interest, and this is where the students gather, and so they end up in mixed ability groupings, and so it's a wonderfully rich opportunity for students to pursue and practice their reading skills in an area of interest, doing some research. So highlights from this summer, <clears throat> we had 31 students and 14 staff, and what I tried to do is keep a little funding aside depending on the numbers of students who are interested. Some summers we've had only 26 students commit, so we would have fewer staff. And we try to match the staff and to the students in terms of groupings. So this summer I did add additional staff because there was more interest. There are about 100 students or so who received an invitation to Summer Reading Academy. Uh, and we work very hard, the co-coordinators especially, they're rather um, persistent with families and teachers, encouraging teachers of these students to speak to parents and encourage them to apply. Uh, we also this year, interestingly enough, we had a past participant who's now a high school student, Hannah Griffin, and she was just wonderful. She wrote an email wondering if she could volunteer some hours because of the wonderful experiences that she had as a camper, back then it was called Camp Read A Lot, uh, and she wanted to volunteer some time. So she ended up with her summer schedule and all, ended up um, providing some volunteer hours around 12 hours this summer. And so it was very inspiring for the younger students. <clears throat> as you notice up here, the research topics this year, we took advantage of the Olympics. <clears throat> space, careers, and when I grow up, buildings and structures. We identify those topics based on the students. Interestingly enough, we had about two, three, or four from grades K <coughs> right through five, but grade one we had 15 students. And so we're really, yeah, in first grade. And so it's kind of, it's a great moment to grab first grade students. Um, <coughs> but it's also a testament to our early intervention as well. Uh, and interestingly enough, of our campers this summer, 21 were male and 9 were female. And so some of these topics were designed to maybe appeal to certainly both sexes, but um, we had some very active participants this summer. Feedback from staff, interestingly enough, uh, one staff person talked about the um, modeled lessons, what the uh, co-coordinators do is they would model certain lessons in terms of reading strategies and then the staff would have to practice modeling those lessons with each other and with the students and get feedback on that. So it was an opportunity to practice. But the second comment in terms of feedback and the staff provide uh, written feedback at the end and then we, I do a debrief with the co-coordinators was really the focus and the energy in the tone of this comment um, that this person really felt energized seeing the progress that was made in such a short period of time with the students over the Summer Reading Academy. And she ends it great to see that growth in young period, <coughs> in young people, excuse me. The small group instruction portion, as I described earlier, is really targeted towards specific skills. And as you can see from this comment, uh, uh, I think Hannah had her influence. Uh, and this young entering sixth grader wants to be able to come back next summer and help the kindergartners with their reading. The research project was quite a hit. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see on the left, uh, the teachers combined and the students self-selected uh, their topics and so they worked on the research pieces and it was not research the way we know research in the past where we explore a topic uh, and we have note cards and we produce a paper. It's really in line with what we're promoting in terms of research in the 21st century where students ask questions about that topic. They propose the questions and then they propose the plan and the sources of information that they want to explore in order to receive answers to their questions. At the end, the second to last day, all parents were invited and other family members were invited to come in and each group did a presentation or an exhibition of their research. And it was active participation because we were all asked what our wonders and our wows were. And we had to post them for the students. And so on the final day of the academy, the students read the wows and the wonders. 
and students continued to explore the wonders or the questions the participants had, but also they got some great feedback on what those participants learned from that student research, that authentic student research. So it was a very powerful experience for the students and for the staff. Any questions? Yes. Can you talk about how students are, how and why students are invited? How and why students are invited? Certainly. Uh, what we're trying to do is build a K through five or middle school. In some years, we, we have offered middle school summer experiences. And again, it is to um, provide some continuous learning experience for those students who may experience some what we refer to as summer slides, particularly in reading. Uh, so the students who receive academic support, services, additional support in reading, uh, are invited. Uh, also, special ed students are also invited, uh, and we work based off the recommendations of the resource room teachers. And then Chris and I will have conversations around, okay, how about this kiddo, if they're invited for ESY, we coordinate that to identify what might we suggest as the best placement for that particular child. And how, what percentage are, what number of students uh, come year after year? Do you track that at all? What percentage of students come every year? Do you, do you see it in terms of repeat oh, participants? Mm -hmm. participants? Uh, again, we, in some cases, we really don't want repeat participants. Mm -hmm. The whole goal is to um, transition students out so they would not need the summer support services. So I'd have to mine that data a little bit. There are some needs that reoccur. And another piece that starts happening is the word is out, and we do get some pressure from students parents or families whose siblings also are, may not be receiving academic support services, but are struggling and can we accommodate them? And if we don't have a wait list, we try and accommodate those folks as well. Uh, so we really try to get folks there. There is a fee that we charge for this, but we also offer a scholarship and we ask people to um, contribute whatever they feel that they can afford. Um, towards this effort, uh, it certainly doesn't, it offsets the cost, it certainly doesn't um, pay for all costs mm -hmm. associated with this. Anyone else? Oh, thank you, Monique. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. So um, our final summer presentation is um, going to be presented by Ann Lovejoy. Ann is our K-2 principal at Eight Corners, and she's talking about the kindergarten jump start in camp. <laughs> Hello, I'm Lovejoy, and I'm talking about this. I'll try to not go on all night, but <laughs> so much fun to talk about jump start and, and kindergarten camp. So as you can see, um, this is one of the activities that kids do when they come to jump start. So they fill letters with their bodies and think kinesthetically as well as um, orally and all kinds of ways. I'll show you in a minute. So we have two programs in the summer. Um, and forgive me for, for repeating myself, those of you who have heard it, but Jumpstart was the original program, started four years ago. It started with, four, uh, with two classes, uh, the 15 to 2 ratio, and they have a um, the two teachers in each classroom with 15 kids plus one teacher that bridges between the two that manages um, the homework bags and the uh, assessments and all the other little things that have to be managed when you have um, kiddos in the room and parents calling and things like that with four-year-olds coming into the school that have never been here. So we had, uh, we had two full-time Jump Start classrooms this year with uh, actually 16 kids in each one. We had more kids uh, want to come than we had anticipated, but we figured we could handle 16 to, to 2. So we let them, let them squeeze in. We we're happy to have them. Again, it's an intensive literacy program where everything is around the letters, names, and sounds, and starting to build reading. Um, they, it's a very repetitive kind of program, and every day is, is, is very uh, familiar with routine building. They have a letter of the day, and then we only had 23 days this year with the 4th of July being on a Monday. So um, we had 23 days, so a couple of days we had, had to double up on letters, but um, kids get the letter painted on their face the first thing when they walk in, sort of as a kinesthetic activity, and everything they do has to do with the letter of the day and the sound that that letter makes and the name of that letter, and whether it's a song or a dance or a, 
a poem or a book or whatever they're doing. So um, they they build books, they they write books, they illustrate, they sing, dance, all kinds of things. Kindergarten camp is an evolution of Jumpstart that we um, probably should. I don't know, copyright and brand and start selling ourselves because it's a, <laughs> it's a little bit different from the Jumpstart program. What we learned in Scarborough is that many of our children have high quality preschool experiences. They have uh, well-educated parents who introduce literacy early to their children so that their, uh, the needs of our kiddos are not quite the same as the needs of the kids where the original Jumpstart program was targeted and developed. So kindergarten camp is that evolution. It's a three-week session. So we took the, the camp and cut it in half. And um, we also expanded the opportunity so that there's numeracy, there's um, cutting, pacing, morning meeting, all kinds of other things that come into it that the Jumpstart kids get, but maybe on a smaller, much smaller, less rigorous scale. But it's really an opportunity to practice what a day of kindergarten is like. Uh, we try to group the kids as much as possible with the kids that are going to be at their home school because all the kids in the district do come to Eight Corner. Um, so we try to keep all the Blue Point kiddos together so they can make new friends and have a familiar face. Um, it's, a, it's a really awesome opportunity for kids to practice being with new adults, being with new people, new friends, being in a new environment, being in a big school and not in daycare, um, using the playground, riding on the bus, walking down the hall, waiting their turn in line, um, using big potties that are loud, using you know the water fountain, and all the things that they may or may not have at their preschools and their daycares. Um, so again, we had two sessions of that, and it was a 15 to 2 ratio, and we could have accommodated up to 90 kids this summer. We had a little over 80 that actually participated, and you know, we offer it to everybody that registers for kindergarten in the spring. And whether you registered in the week that was the official registration week in March or whether you registered um, in the middle of June because you just moved to town or had been meaning to get to it and were away that week, you're offered <coughs> kindergarten camp or jump start. So it is really offered to everybody who registers. And uh, we had about 60 little under 60 kids participate, which I thought was great. Um, and again, it's only three weeks, so so parents don't feel like they're committing their whole summer. Um, and we don't charge anything, so that's something that you want to think about. <laughs> so the things that they do in the day, and it's just slides with kids. They, like I said, they build letters, they make books, they use um, the Handwriting Without Tears, which is the Scarborough adopted curriculum for handwriting. Um, you just see some kids doing things. They have poetry. They use the number cards, and these number cards, these, I mean, these letter cards, um, are used at recess as well. So kids have uh, a ticket to get out to recess, where they have to tell you what the letter of the day is, what sound it makes, tell you a word that it starts with. They usually have to write it in chalk on the sidewalk outside before they can run up to the playground and play. As the teachers are pushing them on the swing or letting them go down the slide, they're saying, you know, what's the letter of the day? And they're just, you know, it's just a constant repetition of this to get that in, ingrained in them. Um, they do a lot of reading. There's just exposure to books all the time. They do buddy reading. And that's and that's the reading. <laughs> so it's, it's a great program. Both of them are, are wonderful. and. Um, you know, we always look for ways to get more parents to participate, especially in the camp program, just because it is a very really small, nice little way to practice going to kindergarten, practicing being on the bus, getting to know new people, so open to suggestions and thinking, and how we can encourage more people to, to participate. And how many students did you say participated in Jumpstart? We had two full-time classes with 16 in each in the Jumpstart program. We had four sessions of camp, two, two the first three weeks and two the second three weeks, and there were um, some kids started and didn't finish, but um, it was about 50 kids in total for those four programs. Okay. How many hours are they there for the camp? Uh, they're from 8 to 12. 
as I recall, last year at some point you had made a presentation with, um, may, uh, well, I can't remember who it was with, but anyway, um, you had made a presentation that centered around you were connecting with the local preschools and that. Is that one of the things that you had mentioned when you had been meeting with them to try to gear up the kids to come from the preschool to kindergarten? Or is that not something that you had explored at that point? Um, it's certainly something we talked about at those meetings, um, but it wasn't as sort of the focus of those meetings. <coughs> but the preschools end in May or June anyway, so the sort of formal preschool type programs and the daycares. Uh, we try to accommodate families as much as we can. So we have a bus that goes through town and we'll uh, pick up and drop off at Heidi House and Toddlin and Wentworth. Okay. Um, any of the major daycares that, that kids will be coming and going from so that they can have the opportunity to be at the program but still, if their parents are working full time throughout the summer, still get back to their local daycare facility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the only staff that we have is that Rec Camp has a mandatory Thursday field trip <laughs> that they cannot miss because there's no one back at the at Rec Camp. So we might have kids that can only come Monday through Wednesday. So that was our only. Um, and I see Allison nodding. I'm like, yep, that conflicts with us too. And, yep. You know, it's just the way the program works. Like everybody has to do what's best for them. So you know, we accommodated that as best we could and. I keep trying to figure out, well, maybe we shouldn't do Thursdays, but uh, that seems, you know, we wouldn't want to do that either, so. Okay. We met with I met with community services to discuss the issue because we do, it's almost like we compete with community services. Mm -hmm. Would you like to go to a water park for the day, <laughs> or would you like to spend your day on our exciting <laughs> <laughs> and fun as it is. <coughs> um, and so, what we've come up with is during the dates in which these programs are happening, um, what they try to do is to coordinate and have more local field trips, some of the more local field trips. And in some cases, we've had parents every year in the Reading Academy who will pick their child up um, at the end of Reading Academy and take them to, um, to the location in town um, because the Summer Reading Academy, the transportation isn't provided. And so I see heads nodding as well. So we have some mm -hmm. wonderfully committed parents Mm -hmm. um, to our programs to yeah. ensure the continuity. And <coughs> prior to um, to the new Wentworth building opening, when, when community services had their own building, they didn't have four-year-olds in the rec camp program with all these school-aged kids, so we, they didn't have the same <coughs> programming competition, they didn't have the same field trips, they didn't have the same activities as the kids who are already in school. So our kiddos didn't jumpstart because they weren't allowed to be in those programs, didn't have any competition with that. Once they combined those programs and the four incoming kindergartners went into the school-aged program, that was when that, that conflict came up for us. And so yeah. Um, I had the opportunity today to observe in a couple of kindergarten classrooms at Eight Corners, and I saw a lot of the same routines that you were just mentioning. So today was the letter of the day was H, and so the teachers were writing morning messages that were like, Dear Happy Hippos, and um, they had the H's on their face, and you could see all of the different ways that they were exposed to that within text, mm -hmm. um, but then also in isolation. And I just think that for an incoming kindergartner, that must be so comforting to know 11 days in and I kind of already know how school works because that's a big part of being a kindergartner so mm -hmm. um, I thank everyone who worked in the summer program both you know at Jumpstart in the kindergarten camp but also at ESY in the summer reading academy because it really does make a difference for our kids and um, I know it can be a challenge for families sometimes too to make that commitment especially when trans transportation isn't able to be provided so um, I, I love to see that we have a full effort in terms of supporting that summer learning. Thank you, Anne. Very mm -hmm. nice. So the next, how's the next We move mm -hmm. on to 7.2, school um, board goals review. So the next three items kind of all fit together. We're going to look at what were the school board goals last year and then um, talk about what are the goals going to be for this year, and then we'll also talk about different other workshop topics that we're going to 
do. So that's kind of the next three agenda items all kind of support one another. So we can start by reviewing last year's goals, and I have a copy of those. I'm going to pass those around, and there's a couple extra for anyone else who would. Oh, you don't want to say the goals? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> Everybody get something? Oh, yeah. Uh, two sheets here. Okay. 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 And then there's a few extra copies if anyone in the audience would like a copy. So basically, I looked at, um, I pulled out what I, what I remembered from last year. Not just not remembered, but actually had on paper. There, there may be some other goals that you can recall that we're on here, but um, this is what I was able to put together from materials I had. So I'll go ahead and read them out loud for the folks that are watching at home who can't see the paper that's in front of us. There were six goals, school board goals last year. Number one was continue to seek ways to engage the public in an understanding of the school budget, the driving factors and the needs of the school department. Number two was negotiate a three-year contract with teachers. Number three was evaluate our facilities, look for inefficiencies, and develop a five-year plan for improvement. Number four was look for areas of reductions, explore alternative non-tax sources of revenue, i.e. grants, et cetera. Number five was increase use of community and business resources and experiential learning and career exploration. And the final goal, number six, was make organizational decisions with student needs and interests in mind to ensure that both operational and human resources are available to foster a student-centered learning environment and facilitate continuous professional growth. Jackie? Uh, number two uh, would probably be changed. Uh, we've accomplished number two as is, but we will be negotiating contracts with support staff and bus drivers. Those are the two, right, Joanne? Mm -hmm. Have we had a letter yet? Bus drivers and support, support staff. Support staff. Any comments or reflection on the first goal? Continue to seek ways to engage the public in understanding the school budget. I just also ha I added to that. I'm just sort of scribbling down notes, but I added to that um, engage the public in understanding of the school budget. But I also included understanding of teaching and learning in the 21st century. I think that sort of goes hand in hand. <coughs> um, good point. I don't know if we're discussing this, but I, I sort of feel like having the public understand the budget requires them to understand um, more in depth about what's actually happening inside the school. You know, I could just add that in there unless you want a separate. No. Yeah, I just added it after the school budget part. <coughs> I think that also goes along with um, what I hear the school board talking about in terms of, you know, finding more creative ways to communicate and make sure that we're really getting the message out so that our community understands the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think while this is obviously a communication issue, number one, I would like I would like one of these bullets to be actual. Um, communication, uh, a communication goal. So write a new one. If, if that's how we're doing this, yes, I guess. And I, and I think it can be as easy as communicate in a variety of ways um, mm -hmm. to the community. I think to all constituents. To all constituents. I think we have um, people who 
would prefer email and then people who would prefer it mailed to their house or seeing it in the leader or um, maybe even on television, who knows. But I think if, if, we're, if we're proactive in providing a variety of ways that people can get that information, it would help um, the under number one. It would help in <laughs> the public understanding the budget, understanding what's happening inside of our schools and all that. I think in terms of the, um, the public understanding, I think that the new format of the budget that was developed last year went a long way mm -hmm. towards this particular specific goal and an understanding of the budget. The new format mm -hmm. that it was put into is very readable and very user friendly. <coughs> And just adding to what Jody said, through the community questionnaire, I have been getting lots of feedback on the different ways people want different types of information communicated. So for example, if it's you know emergency school closings or things like that, people want um, to receive that message one way versus if it's just routine information. Mm -hmm. um, and other folks have said, do more radio interviews, do more television interviews and things like that so that it's another way to to access the testing inside the school. Great. I don't know how specific we want the goals to be, and it might fit into um, maybe six. Um, just a continued commitment to look at school start times. I uh, yeah, actually was hoping we would discuss that as a separate issue because I think, and I have a question for the superintendent. The biggest issue that I hear with regards to school bus, school start time is busing. And I don't know if we have the capability in-house, quite frankly, to evaluate how we can make our buses fit into the schedule that we want to provide. And and I really hate to think that our ability or inability to bus students is going to handicap us in our ability to change the start times. That, that the facts seem to indicate are necessary for our students. And whether it's, I don't know what weather is that I'm trying to, because I've been thinking on this a lot over the last several months. And I'm usually pretty good at solving problems, but I can't solve this one. And I don't, as I say, I'm not certain we have the resources in-house to do this, and whether or not there's a resource that we can purchase to figure it out. I don't know if that's available either. Mm -hmm. But I think it is something that, on a personal note, as a school board person, I want to address now. Mm -hmm. And I would like it resolved before the end of this school year. We're either going to do it, and we're going to implement it, or we're going to say, we just can't do it. One, one way or the other, I think we have to make a decision. We've been talking about it for two years, I'm through just talking personally. I think talking time is over, doing time has arrived. So to answer what I think the question is, can we do some sort of transportation audit to evaluate the efficiency of our, our current fleet? Um, that's definitely something that we can do and something I was actually talking with our, our business manager about today is looking at um, you know where we have if we have flexibility, where the flexibility might be, and go through some of those potential, like what if scenarios. Um, and I know a lot of work has been done on the start time issue, so um, over the next few months I plan to get those folks together and really learn more about what have we already done, what are the questions that we still have, and what is some of the work that needs to be done moving forward. Uh, but our intention is definitely to continue that momentum that's already started and looking at the efficiency of our current transportation fleet as part of that. I think Jackie makes a good point about, you know, maybe bringing it to a workshop session as well, which might be in the next little piece we're going to talk about. 
So the, the whole board is kept abreast of how the process is moving along? Donna, I don't, I don't think we're ready for a workshop unless we can solve the busing problem because I've been told by the former superintendent, by the assistant superintendent, uh, b by everybody in town practically, that unless we can solve the bus, the transportation issue for our students, that's the biggest monkey wrench. And, and as I say, if we don't have the resources in the house to figure that out, then I think we should look elsewhere. Somebody has figured it out. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think through the possible options that you're looking at mm -hmm. might bring us to a place where we have some answers about that. And I'm just saying to, you know, I'm feeding back what you said about, you know, a workshop and actually having it so that we keep up, everyone is up, up abreast of what is happening on this topic because it certainly is a hot topic for board members as well as community yeah, members. Absolutely. So. So what I would propose is the idea of um, allowing me to develop a plan that would include putting together um, an internal committee that can analyze all of the information that we already have, but also determine what other information do we need, for example, surveying the community, surveying the staff. Um, that's an important piece that I don't think we have done yet. Uh, and then also connecting with other communities and finding out how did this work for you, um, you know, what would the impact be on our community because every community is a little bit different. Um, and then that would be, I, I would imagine, presenting that start time plan during the workshop would be a great way for us to kind of bring everyone up to speed, um, including the community so that they know where we are in the, in the conversation. One of the things I have learned, knowing that this is important to our residents here in Scarborough is there's um, a lot of districts who have adjusted start times well, and there's a lot of just districts who have not done this work really well and weren't really thoughtful about um, how they included the community. And you know, just thinking about early childhood, we have to think about those partners in the community and what's the impact on them. Um, you know, of course, our families. You know, what does adjusting start time mean for our families and our kids? Um, we know what the research says, and that's really clear. No one can argue that at this point. Um, so it's not a matter of do we believe in it or is it good for our kids. It's just working out those logistical things. Um, and I like to think that we can always work through logistics. With lots of smart things. We're so <laughs> spread out as a community. Mm -hmm. that's, that's our biggest problem. We know that. Yep. But I still think it has to be solvable somehow. Should I say something on number three? The evaluating of the facilities. Um, when we had done our long range facilities plan and had a presentation, um, Todd Jepson was going to be working with Dan Cecil to come up with a list in conjunction with, I think, Kate, kind of doing audits on the different buildings. We already had a, a partial list from two years ago that Dan had kind of worked up. So some of the things like were insulation in roofing areas and mm -hmm. things like that. but. Um, since we kind of had a hiccup this summer with Todd being out a bit, I'm not sure, I haven't approached it with him yet, mm -hmm. trying to let him get his feet back in mm -hmm. for inquiring if he's gotten any more information from the NC to learn. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. that's still, still on the plan. I mean, I think that's a pretty important one to me anyways that we, we move forward on some of the work that will have to be done in order to begin to mm -hmm. think about what, what, what are the most important things first and then creating this plan so that we you know, can share that with our community and with our council. I know that on the long range facilities plan that um, the committee that we worked on, mm -hmm. uh, Todd has begun looking at some of those suggestions mm -hmm. that Dan Cecil made. And for instance, at Blue Point School, there was a roof, um, uh, part of the roof was uh, done this summer, and that was on the list. Um, so mm -hmm. he's trying to fix some of those, mo you know, things the to keep the building things. going before the whole roof, you know, goes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So okay. he's trying to be proactive with the list. Right. All right. Perfect. And it has to do with housing starts. And mm -hmm. We've got a number of housing starts. Mm -hmm. I mean, it slowed down at one point, and now boom, here we go again. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so number four was looking for areas of reduction, explore alternative non-tax sources of revenue. Um, this is a good one to keep as a goal. It's kind of just a common practice of <coughs> highly efficient and effective schools. Um, we're always doing that and looking for creative funding. <laughs> Also on, on that same vein too, I had a few people approach me about um, whether or not the town and the school department should be looking at a joint position that is a shared position that includes a portion of grant writing mm -hmm. in that position. So that might be something to consider you now as we get into the, the budget weeds of the budget and, and just in discussions with the council, maybe the two finance groups would, would kick off that discussion mm -hmm. and um, just take a look at what are some of, pe some of the pieces that we feel on both sides need to be taken care of and look for a position that, you know, in part is doing grant writing. Mm -hmm. yep. Definitely some very difficult for, I'm going to be honest, very difficult for Scarborough mm -hmm. because the, usually it says, you know, one of the requirements is 40% free and reduced lunch and we mm -hmm. do not meet that requirement at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, a, it's at least worth sort of Yes, because there, I think there's out, there could be outside In private corporations right, that might be able to private, right. um, get this. Mm -hmm. Some grants from right. right. But I mean, a lot of the federal state. ones, or the yeah. lot of the ones you hear, and these other schools that mm -hmm. are receiving them, it's because we do not have that requirement. Right. right. And it would be interesting if there were a way to, um, again, reach out to community members. There may be people in the community who work for companies. I know mm -hmm. that, um, there's a car dealership in Saco, I think, who uh, there's. A, a dad or a citizen in town who works there and approach the schools to say, hey, you know, you can apply for grants. Now, granted, these grants are, are small, small mm -hmm. um, but every every dollar Udum helps. Does, Udum does a two-for-one match. Right. We're looking. So people donating that work for you know, mm -hmm. if they donate 10 bucks, mm -hmm. we get 20. Right. Mm -hmm. We're also working with our Scarborough Ed Foundation. Um, they support innovation grants for, mm -hmm. uh, for, for our teachers, and they are um, looking at other ways that they can support our teachers, and so that's been a great partnership. They actually came to opening day to help remind our teachers that they're a, a resource for us. And we have um, a community business partnership. Uh, Mr. Creech is a part of that work as Monique really is leading that work and I'm still learning about that but I know at our November meeting we're planning to revisit the mission of that partnership uh, or those partnerships I should say and one of the focus of that is making sure that um, it's a give-get relationship on both sides so um, a lot of companies in Scarborough and businesses in Scarborough want to be able to support us in providing internships or volunteer opportunities and also resources in some cases um, and in turn you know we're they're learning more about ways that they can support the community and it kind of um, we're going to continue to explore that and define that at our next meeting but I think that this this really opens up a whole host of ideas and, and possibilities for us. You know when I was first on the school board we had uh, partnerships uh, with what was Blue Cross Blue Shield at the time. Mm -hmm. We had teachers who went over there for a semester to learn what was going on okay. and and people from Blue Cross Blue Shield came mm -hmm. and worked with some of our middle school and high school students. We had a partnership with uh, Hannaford through their Human Resources Department uh, they did a lot of work with the school board and with the administrators on team building and and all of those types of things. They had a huge human resources department. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who gave us the first Myers-Briggs, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have had some very good relationships in the past that have really benefited our school. And uh, the result of one of the results of the uh, 
Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, affiliation was, they gave us a donation of, I can't recall what it was, of, it was a long time ago. Do you remember what it was? What, no, I did have three teachers who participated in it. It was a good experience, they said. Excellent. Yeah, and I think for those partnerships to really um, last, it has to be that, that give and get kind of relationship. So um, I'm confident that we'll be able to build some strong partnerships that will benefit our students. Number five, increased use of community and business resources and experiential learning. That kind of goes along with what I was mm -hmm. just saying, right. the community partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also starting to explore some other opportunities that we can um, present to our students at the high school level that allow them to explore more technical careers um, in addition to you know the college readiness, really mm -hmm. trying to make it a well-rounded opportunity. I don't know if those two become end up becoming one that really focuses on building mm -hmm. community partnerships and maximizing creative funding sources or something like that. Um, and then number six is about making organizational decisions with student needs um, and interests in mind to ensure that both operational and human resources are available to foster student-centered learning, um, a student-centered learning environment and facilitate continuous professional growth. That seems like a pretty constant. Right. <laughs> I, sort of feel, I sort of feel like that one should, uh, it's semantics, but I feel like that one should go at the top. Okay. It seems weird that it was just so I would support that. Mm -hmm. okay. Gee, you made two good suggestions. Yeah. I've been at middle school on that. I'm <laughs> smarter <laughs> than the average parent. <laughs> I was looking back at previous on school board goals and objectives and I noticed that before there would be kind of a goal and then different targets mm -hmm. and um, not that we have to flesh that all out tonight but I think that that really helps us communicate more clearly mm -hmm. with the community because some of these are really big goals and then we could even use that to help us think about you know by when and like when do mm -hmm. we think we can accomplish that and how will we know that we accomplished it mm -hmm. um, that would be a suggestion I'd put on the table. The other thing is that we really don't have anything major here concerning the budget or, or our work with the council as we did last year. So it seems to me, I mean, that's a really important piece of our work uh, once the budget is developed within the district to give them the approval and moving forward and fully vetting that budget and doing so in public, but also um, you know, making sure that we communicate well with the community and, and with the council on that. Well, budget. Really so I think that's it a seems good like that would be like a major one for mm -hmm. a list of, of goals. Yeah, and I think, I guess my feeling is, is that's going to always happen, but I mean, we can put it as a goal to continue um, the strong relationship with the council mm -hmm. through the budget cycle. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't hurt to have it in writing. Yeah, and, and clarifying, and clarifying what's in the budget to the community. Is that number one, or is that a combination of number one and the one we added around communication in a variety of ways to all constituents? Mm -hmm. I think it's a separate. For me, it's a separate one. I think it is. I think it should be. I mean, a separate one. We're a board. Uh, uh, this board ought to be telling the community we're working hard on that budget, and and we're going to do everything we can to make sure you understand that budget. Well, I think that's number one. I think you know, continue to seek ways to engage the public in understanding of the school budget. I think the part that's missing on this these goals from last year is the uh, work with the uh, town council. The council. The collabor collaboration. I thought that the collaboration is right. really crucial, and that's what I'd like to see represented. So does that become a target of number one, or do we still want to just pull it out? Of the I feel like number one is really different. Number one is really about sort of transparency and you know sort of education and information. 
and that what we're talking about is more about process, and I feel like those are two distinct things. Okay. Well, why don't, why don't we have the superintendent put these together as we've articulated them, and then we can work from, we have a plan, and then we can work from the plan to, put to the delineate target. how we want to address the plan. I think that um, I'm happy to contribute with that, but it would probably be best for the school board to do that work. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't say we weren't going to do the work. Okay. I th if you, you're going to take, you or Kelly going to take the notes that we've made tonight and put them into what our suggestions. Okay. In the order that we thought we would like them changed, and then we can work, we would have the plan to work from. And then at that point, then we once could we have them, then we can create so the target. Yeah, okay. okay. that's, that's what I'm saying. No, I don't want you to do the work. Just the template. I just want so you to, we can fill it in. to yeah. put it together, what we, figure out what we said. <laughs> <laughs> Make it sound sensible. <laughs> right. <laughs> Or maybe we give it to Kate because she's the wordsmith. <laughs> we'll work on it together. Um, any other additions to the 2016-17 goals? Draft goals at this point? <laughs> I'm wondering, and, and I don't know if this should be a school board goal or not, but it's, oh, I have a cramp, excuse me. Uh, there's a big emphasis on food, especially for our children. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I had an email as a Kwanian this week. Did, did you get the email as well? Mm -hmm. That there are 15 families at the moment for whom we're asked to provide food over the Columbus Day weekend. Mm -hmm. And that's through the program at, at Wentworth. So. Anybody wants to contribute to that, uh, as you have in the past, please do so. And there's the meeting on the 24th, 27th, that's being organized by Project Grace, if the school department is in, has been invited to, and I've been invited, and other community organizations have been invited mm -hmm. to address the program in Scarborough. So I just want us to think about whether or not that should be one of our goals as well. It, I'm not saying we should do it tonight, I'm just asking us to think about it. So you mean to make sure that the students are nourished properly in order to access the learning better? Is that what you're well, saying? Well, it's, you know, it's a fact. It, it's children right. who have been, had a good breakfast mm -hmm. do better in school. And if they've had something to eat, they probably can study better at night. I mean, even just that small program in Westbrook has proven that for, for those youngsters. So uh, I'm not saying we should have a be feeding the children three meals a day, but I'm saying as a school community, we should continue to make the total community aware of the needs, that being one of them. Maine is one of the most food insecure states. Mm -hmm. If not, I think it might be the. It's the most. The most. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And what is it like? Twelve percent. I think it's even higher than that, depending on where you are in the state. Um, yeah. But mm -hmm. especially for um, young children, we are at the very bottom of the pack for right. food security. So maybe that falls under um, our future number one. Six. Currently number six, yeah. but. Um, making organizational decisions with student, student needs. Maybe that falls, you know, when mm -hmm. maybe that could be a target under mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. instead of a separate goal, possibly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just want us to be aware of it because I've been involved with it, you know, as Kelly has been almost from its inception here in town. Mm -hmm. So it's become one of my passions, I guess. And these 15 families are within. Scarborough. These are Scarborough families. Mm -hmm. The way the program works is that the students, the eligible students are identified through our through the school department. Mm -hmm. And then the families are able to request 
that's the way I understand it. They're they're asked whether or not they, they need, like and then we provide there's through donations. There's generally um, families who don't qualify for um, government assistance, so they're kind of like in that limbo area where mm -hmm. they don't have enough, but they can't qualify for for um, supplemental food means otherwise. So um, it started with cafeteria workers noticing kids trying to get extra things in their lunch or um, always not having a snack at snack time. And so it was actually the food service workers that started on their own with money out of their own pocket. And so now it's um, supported by, like Kiwanis always donates, um, you know, just other little community groups. And when kids need service projects, they'll often do um, food drives. And um, I think it's, Right now it might be 15 families, but it's been up to like 90 kids yeah. for long weekends and vacations. So, um, I think during Thanksgiving and Christmas are the numbers well, the Yeah, when they're longer breaks. So there's the kids that are not getting free and reduced lunch? Some are. Some but are. Some, some are, are just, yeah. they don't qualify. <coughs> for example, Kiwanis purchased 80 turkeys for the Scarborough Food Pantry last Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. So our goal this year, for example, is going to be to purchase a hundred turkeys. So, and other organizations, not just Kiwanis, mm -hmm. who does these things. Mm -hmm. uh, other organizations in town do. But if right. if we're feeding a hundred families at Thanksgiving time, some of those families, if not all of them, have children mm -hmm. yeah. in our schools. And I think our like. 16.8 or 9% of our students qualify as being economically disadvantaged for free and reduced lunch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So our numbers have gone up since last year because we were at what, like 4, 50, 20. Yeah, okay. I thought it was like it's been going up yeah. every Yes. Yeah. I didn't want to belabor that point. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. an important message. Um, anything else on the goal? The other thing that stuck out to me a little bit was um, facilitate continuous professional growth um, and just continuing to monitor how that's going, just make sure that our staff is um, both having the time that they need and using the time that they need and, um, and how that's going. It'll just be interesting to um, see how that mm -hmm. progresses this year um, with uh, the high school additional start. And just a, um, a point of information for the community, we, as we are making this shift to a more student-centered learning environment or a student-centered learning environment for our kids, we're also thinking about that at leadership, how do we make professional learning more learner-centered for our teachers so that they have choice and voice and path and pace the same way that we're creating that for our students. So. Um, we're constantly trying to, you know, practice that together as a leadership and then model that for our teachers and building meetings and other professional opportunities. Okay. So um, the last item is looking at different workshop topics. So this is what was on the list, the suggested list from the school board last year, and I would follow the probably the same um, pattern as last year where I would ask the school board to make a list of topics you want to know more about and then together as a leadership team we will prioritize and strategically map them out throughout the year so that you're getting that just-in-time information when it's most relevant based on what's happening either with the fiscal cycle or the instructional mm -hmm. cycle. <laughs> well, I think that the next uh, yeah. One of the topics for our next workshop should be how things are working with the new superintendent. I mean that sincerely. You know, uh, how are things, what do you need from us? The whatever. Okay. I mean, I'm just one person. Well, well, <coughs> yeah, I was just going to say. So when I look at this list, you probably know what I'm going to say. Okay. When I look at this list, I I don't know how to say this um, politely, but I feel like 
we didn't do this last year. Now, we had a couple, but most of this list could just be like, yep, let's do these because we didn't do them last year and we still want to. So, <laughs> because so can we read the list for the public yes. so that they can yes. hear what's on the list because mm -hmm. they can't see it? Jody, would you like to read them? Oh, sure. <laughs> wow. uh, so the first one is ways that the school can generate revenue. The second one is NEASC update. The third <laughs> one, high school, middle school mentoring, marketing to seventh graders. Fourth one, um, FAQs, terminology education. We talk a lot of education speak, and I think the general public has no idea what we're talking about some of the time. Uh, number five, I'm at five, one, two, three, four, five, the simplifying school budget. I think we can continue that, but I sort of feel like we made big strides on that big last strides. year with the way it's presented. Number six, inquiry teams and inquiry-based learning. We did that last year. We had this workshop. Um, my person, okay. Um, outreach and communication strategies, community and with the town council. Next one is finance and revenue sources, athletics and activities. For example, gate receipts, how does that all work? Um, it's always an ongoing conversation. And short and long-term facilities plan. Can I ask one thing? Yes. When we were in our joint finance committee meetings, we came up with some education terminology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. We did that work. So, mm -hmm. but I know that that was just our right. joint mm -hmm. finance committees. Yeah. Can we resurrect this is five more? Can mm -hmm. we resurrect that document? Yes. Mm -hmm. That we have, and then, I, yeah, I, I don't know where the final. I mean, I've seen a printed copy of it. Or I have a printed right. copy of it. But as far as that document goes, is there a way we can pull it out? Because maybe not everything would be our education terminology because it's some of us <coughs> talking about the town council side of it. But right. maybe we can use mm -hmm. that as kind of a jumping off point for that topic. Well, and I think the superintendent this evening did exactly one of the things that we had mentioned in the past. Is she made certain that she introduced our speakers. Sometimes we have said, you know, uh, the curriculum director will, everybody doesn't know her name, you know, mm -hmm. or the high school principal. Or, so I, I really like the fact that you say that when he covers in the curriculum director, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So she, Sorry, I just had a question really quickly. Yeah. Um, the one that says high school, middle school mentoring in the marketing to seventh graders. Is there anyone who can kind of explain on what that, that means? Yeah. Down here. <laughs> Hi. So that was actually my idea. Okay. Because I went through it in the last couple of years with my own yeah. kids. Um, in seventh grade, they're already getting mail from um, Chevrolet and the Main Girls Academy and other local high schools mm -hmm. and they're going to open houses there and they're hooking up with high school students there and the decision is already made by the start of eighth grade and they have for the most part their only experience with the high school is the auditorium and the gym mm -hmm. and they don't know anything else that goes on during the day they don't see the rest of the facilities but they're getting tours at these private schools and it looks fantastic and they are like stars in their eyes immediately about oh this school is so great our school is so great, but they just don't know it yet. So um, that was an idea I had for seventh graders to um, get hooked up with a tenth grader because when they would get to high school, those tenth graders would yeah. still be there and there could be some ongoing community building between the middle school and high school students and just give them an opportunity to see what we have to offer here, which is a lot. And um, I just feel like we're losing some of our best students every year when eighth grade ends, we're losing them to these other high schools and it's nobody's fault, it's just they don't have the information to compare it to because the private schools are doing like actual heavy marketing to the seventh graders actively. Mm -hmm. so. I'm curious to know how many of those students that have left after eighth grade and have gone to one of these various other places. Mm -hmm. How many are coming back their sophomore yeah. and or junior year? We have quite a few that come back. And having left Chevrolet or Maine Girls yep. Academy or wherever it might be. Most of them with the mm -hmm. academy. Yeah. yeah. 
But I think the point of the... To keep them here, but I Well, it's to keep them here, but also it provides... It provides a connection with, mm -hmm. if, if it goes sort of the way she's talking about with the 7th graders and 10th graders, that relationship continues in 8th grade and 11th mm -hmm. grade, and then it continues when they're freshmen and a senior. So it creates this relationship over the course of the year that would help in other ways, not just right. keeping the kids here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it provides those Social network. It's role modeling. Yeah. It's yeah. just aspirational. Mm -hmm. I just think it's... Look at the excitement that Jody's idea of the seniors marching created in this town. <laughs> <laughs> it happened somewhere else. It was not my idea. I just well, you brought it here, though. Are we doing I mean, it was your idea to do it in Scarborough. And I will tell you. I don't want to take that credit. Oh. Mary Starr sent it to me. I don't want to take credit where it's not. <laughs> no, <due>. no. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Starr. Yeah, 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 whatever. Are. But you are the person who got it going, going here. And the excitement in our, in our students and, and and their the teachers at the elementary school and the middle school seeing these students. Mm -hmm. We need to do things like that for our students and just like you're saying get those seventh graders up there before the Christmas vacation time the holiday vacation time so they we can do that right. so maybe a workshop topic would be um, because that's generating an idea for a new type of program. And I know that the high school and the middle school are already doing a lot of things around advisory and how to help kids feel more connected to not only their peers, but also to the staff. So maybe um, a great workshop topic would be having the, each principal come and talk about the different ways that we're building connections and exposing students. Like I'm thinking about what they do with the second graders going to Wentworth right. where they plant the sunflower seeds the sunflower seedlings and then they get to come back in the fall. Like all those little things matter. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that each of the schools does different things in a little different ways depending mm -hmm. on the ages of the kids. So mm -hmm. would that be a good topic just to kind of, you yeah. know, hear yeah. the different ways that we're helping create connectedness for our kids? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you think it would be a good topic for it's us to hear about? Yeah, I mean, I, I um, to be honest, watched a couple of workshops but couldn't really understand the difference because this is a new experience for me mm -hmm. and I was thinking about what becomes a workshop topic versus what becomes just a, a celebration presentation or an informative presentation um, because I, I was thinking you know we have six schools and I want the community to know what's happening in all six of those schools often but if we only have a workshop meeting every other month that would take us all year to get an update. So um, thinking about what's appropriate for a um, business meeting versus what's more appropriate for a workshop meeting is, you know, one of the things that I leave, you know, look to you for a little guidance on, but also am thinking about. Well, I, I think personally the way to get more publicity, if you will, for the individual schools is, is to get our students who are, are on uh, what is this, the media committee or whatever, into the schools with the, and taking photographs, videos, and putting them on the, on the local channel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have that. I know that, oh. but, but we don't, we haven't planned, I don't think it's been planned. I don't think they plan to go down uh, and to do Pleasant Hill School, for example. Okay and show the children in classrooms and out on the playground and doing whatever they're doing, just maybe a 10 or 15 minute video of each of the schools. And that's something that could be worked into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. I think we have had some business meetings that have had presentations at them mm -hmm. that are celebrating different schools and activities that have happened. Maybe the first 15 minutes mm -hmm. um, would be some kind of presentation we have had that before on like update, where the superintendent invites somebody in yeah. for the first maybe during your superintendent's report I know okay. it's been done where you say oh and tonight we have so and so and so and so coming from the K2 right. school to tell us about right you know and these couple of little young young students get up and tell us 
something that they did over at the school. There's a girl who's been here from Wentworth who was doing the Beanie Baby Drive. That was part of the superintendent's oh, report. Oh, that was, that, you know, there are... tears to my eyes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there have been... So, yeah, during okay. the business meeting sometimes for those little celebrations, mm -hmm. for bigger things, I don't know. And we're brainstorming lots of ideas about, a, you know, piggybacking on what we were saying earlier around that communication goal, some different mm -hmm. ideas and ways that we can get the community, you know, inside the school, whether physically or virtually. So um, mm -hmm. be on the lookout for that coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I definitely think that, you know, getting the NEAS updates from the high school, that's something that we're going to do regularly. Um, we can work with our high school leadership team to find out the best way for that to happen and how frequently it should happen. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll, we'll be sure that we'll keep you apprised to that work because a lot of effort is going into that work. Um, a lot of teachers putting an extra time, along with the leadership putting an extra time to make sure that that's a really thorough and meaningful process. Um, so I like keeping that on the list for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think um, finance revenue sources and ways that the school can generate revenue could be consolidated into one if you were interested in even discussing it. But. Mm -hmm. But but you and Joanne should have input into this as well. Oh, we will. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, a lot of times there are certain updates that you are required that right, you always right. give to us. So we know so that know. this list is just some of yep. this list. But I also feel like the long and short and long term facilities plan. We had that on last year because we were concerned about enrollment and were, you know, how were the K two schools looking versus. Wentworth and all of that, and I and think the middle school is bursting. Right, so I feel like we've sort of gone over yeah. that. Now we just need our mm -hmm. what we things are we doing plan. to fix right. some of those items mm -hmm. that they they were things that were getting generated between Dan Cecil and Todd. Yeah, but I don't know that needs to be a whole workshop. No, I oh I don't think so because we did that because we had the presentation from Dan Cecil when he yeah. came in, mm -hmm. and we had planning decisions and all the other mm -hmm. information that came forward for that. And I plan to give you enrollment updates every month at the first meeting of the month so you'll know, you know, what, what are class sizes, you know, how many kids do we have in the district total. That way, both for the board and the community, we're on top of that and seeing how things change throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So that, I feel like that can come more in the form of updates. Yep. So that, are mm -hmm. we on? Is that what yeah, we don't need a workshop. And I think we did inquiry-based learning last year, too. Mm -hmm. And we did what? Inquiry-based inquiry learning. Mm -hmm. we can and we talked about I think you're going to find that come October, there will be a slight influx of students taking up some of the temporary housing at the beach, and then you lose them in May. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. I was looking at last year's enrollment report, and we started and ended with the exact same number, but there was, you know, that little bit of fluctuation mm -hmm. in between. So mm -hmm. I'm guessing it'll be much the same. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other ideas that you're thinking about? The only thing I would add to Jackie's original question: How are things working for the new superintendent? You know that coming um, in December with the entry plan report. So mm -hmm. um, I would probably hold off, and as long as you see me coming to meetings every month, you know that things are <laughs> going good. good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If well, I at any point, then... <laughs> if I go Pokemon looking for the school, <laughs> then we'll... <laughs> Here's the thing, though. I can, I can tell you and everybody else at the table, I have work with several superintendents and it's very easy to get into the routine of, of everyday work and not sit down and have a discussion about anything that could be on your mind or our mind, quite frankly, prior to any six month evaluation or whatever it happens to be. And it doesn't, it's not an evaluation piece, it's a is this working? Is every is it working? What do we do? We need to change anything? And I just want us all of us to know, as we do know, it's so easy to get into a rut. 
with the day-to-day -day routine. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I appreciate that support and that level of concern. Um, and I will be as forthcoming as I can be. So you don't have to be with me, I but with daughter, and then if we all have to... But I just think that it is our job, one of our jobs, is to make your job as easy as possible. I like the way that <laughs> the only one I would add, which we talked about, I think, in our goals or at some point tonight, where the later start times. Yeah. Didn't we talk about that as being a workshop once okay. you have a plan? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? Very good. 8.0. And a motion? To move. Second. All in favor? Seven plus one? Oh, six. Six, six plus one. Kelly stepped out. <laughs> Seven <laughs> plus one. We are adjourned. Okay. Kelly.